All right, welcome back to Checkpoint. We thank you for staying with us. Keep your comments coming in. The hashtag is Checkpoint. Our discussion, you can weigh in. Please feel free to do so. The SMS number is 22155. Let me reintroduce my panel to you tonight. We have Dr. Adam Zolo. Uh, thank you very much. He's a political scientist and senior lecturer at the University of Nairobi. We have Daisy Amdani. Thank you so much. Coordinator of the National Women's Steering Committee and Professor Peter Kagwanja, who's the CEO of the African Policy Institute. Thank you, lady, gentlemen. Um, let's start with you, Prof. Uh, the last voter, uh, the last one week of uh, voter registration. Uh, what's been your take? We'll get into you know a number of things that have been said, um, but let's start with the fact that we've got um, you know politicians from either side going around the country and mobilising their numbers, and some say this should be left strictly to the IEBC that it, it's campaigning in the process of voter registration, which is itself supposed to be a neutral exercise. What do you think? Uh, if we were to talk outside the, the normal Kenyan cynicism, I think it's a good exercise because in some countries, uh, voting, I mean, registering to vote, and actually voting is a constitutional obligation. Mm -hmm. It is written in the law that you must take uh, you voter, you must register as a voter if you reach a certain age, failure to which it's like not mm -hmm. submitting your taxes. Right. Uh, here, I think, uh, if it were not for the environment in which we live, we would be congratulating our politicians for basically taking the lead to turn Kenyans into citizens. Because it is when you can vote, uh, when you can decide who governs over you, when you actually become a citizen or exercise your citizenship. But the environment is, has changed in the sense that, uh, you know, since 2013, uh, we've been talking about this tyranny of numbers. And uh, people want to, to, to be sure that they are not uh, oppressed by this tyranny of numbers. Then you bring out the numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's really a game of numbers. Okay. And uh, th that it's itself is crowding a very, very important uh, civic duty uh, to get people to register to become uh, citizens. All right. And we'll, we'll talk about that obligation to vote, because that's also a, a debate that's come up in the last week or so. Um, but. Before we get to that, uh, you mentioned the, the tyranny of numbers. Uh, Dr. Law, let's, let's talk about that a little bit because uh, some have said that this is where the election will be won in terms of who can get uh, more of their supporters to register over the other. Uh, do you think that is the case at the end of this exercise, you know, based on the numbers that we see, will we be able to tell who's going to win in August? Basically, you know, in politics, you can only get that person who has registered is the only person you can go and make vote. If that person has not registered, then they can be your supporter, they can come to your rally, they can sing your praises, but unless they register, they cannot vote. And I think that's the reason why you find that uh, both sides of the political divide are making sure that when the campaign starts and when August 8th comes, and people go to that ballot paper, they must be eligible people. So indeed, it is true that you can have so many followers, you can have so many supporters, you can have so many adherents, but, and as long as they don't have that vote, then they won't be of help to you on August 8th. Yeah, but it's one thing to get registered as a voter, and it's yet another thing to show up at your polling station on the morning of August the 8th that's indeed true. Uh, to that, vote. That's indeed true. But you have to get that person to register first before you work on a strategy to make them vote. All right. Because even if you are to work on a strategy to make them vote and they are not registered, mm -hmm. they won't be able to Some vote. say this is uh, what cost uh, ODM in the last election. That was all about popularity, uh, but not really about the numbers and the persons that would get registered to vote. Well, I, I don't believe that. But I can tell you one thing for sure, that even if you go to back to those 2013 numbers, they are quite a lot of evidence that indeed, and I think it has been shown, that there are so many, close to two million, which IBC has never challenged, people who supposedly voted for the president alone and didn't vote for the other five seats. Mm. So until the day that IEBC will challenge that evidence that has been put out there, that there are people who supposedly voted only for the president, and we didn't see any ballot papers being returned for the other seats, mm. 
we shall never believe that. Okay, Daisy, uh, Prof here talked about the environment in which, uh, you know, the voter registration exercise is taking place. Uh, could you speak to that a little bit? I mean, there's been, you know, allegations in just week one, uh, you know, alone about uh, rigging. There have been some irregularities that have been reported uh, by political leaders themselves. Speak to us about the environment in which we find ourselves in during this process. Well. I think that um, the politicians have brought a lot of excitement, mm -hmm. uh, the, ex the excitement of the campaigns into the environment. And it is true that there are some glaring irregularities that have been found which um, are very serious and, and need to be addressed. I mean, you have cases of uh, people going to register to vote and finding their ID registered as somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the voter system. We also have the situation where it is becoming evident that uh, the system, the IBC registration system, is not net is not networked, mm -hmm. so that if you register in one place, it will not show if you are registered in somewhere else. So that can also create situations where you have uh, cases of double registration. So there are many issues that are coming out now that I think IBC will have to address themselves to, particularly with regards to the integrity of the voters' register. But also that environment that you're talking about, um, and like some of the sentiments that uh, Professor Kagwanja here has just uh, put out, which are these um, uh, allegations that are made or uh, perceptions that are thrown out there or, or statements that are thrown out there to create certain perceptions like for instance that you will know who will win the election at the end of the voter registration period mm -hmm. or the tyranny of numbers mm -hmm. because I think these are statements that we don't interrogate very well because the last time there was this so-called tyranny of numbers and apparently the tyranny of numbers has somehow dissipated now from just even from a st statistical point of view, you don't just lose your tyranny just like that. So mm -hmm. either a tyranny was never there or something has happened to kill that tyranny of numbers. Okay. The other thing is when you begin to say things like you will know who has won the election based on the number of registered voters in the perceived strongholds, strongholds uh -huh. of certain parties, uh -huh. then you assume that everybody who registers as a voter turns up to vote, yeah. which is not necessarily the case. And turns up case. to vote for the specific for this specific or okay. this, this specific, right. uh, this specific uh, party, party yeah. which is not the case. Because even when you talk about so-called strongholds, there are areas where you will find they are populated by people from outside areas. Because remember that uh, the elections are going to be taking place uh, during August. So a lot of people are going to be in their work state. Right. not necessarily in their, their grassroots uh, areas. So I think that um, there are so many dynamics and, and to just paint them with one brush then begins to set us up for creating perceptions that are not real and that we don't interrogate deeply. Because as it is already, we definitely have serious problems with the integrity of the register. Even when you talk about auditing the register, mm -hmm. we know that um, during the Supreme Court case, uh, the IBC produced three registers. So which register is being audited? Okay. There's also the case that uh, Dr. Olo has talked about. Yeah. So there, there are still many, many issues with regard to the integrity of the voters' register, the auditing of the voters' register and the registration exercise with regard to one, the registration of persons, two, double registration of persons, mm -hmm. three, networking of IEBC, and, and their the registration zero, systems, okay. and the procurement of equipment, in, especially when we All see right. that uh, you know there's been a strong fight for manual identification of voters. You see, if you have at least electronic identification of voters, you'll be able to get rid of a lot of uh, okay. these challenges. Uh, oh, mm. All right, uh, and uh, <laughs> Prof, you, yes. you wanted to weigh in because I, I see you um, reacting to that. Let's talk about the integrity of that. Um, Kalonzo Musyoka just uh, last week. Uh, raised certain issues with his registration and the use of his ID number uh, for a certain uh, Salome Njoroge. Um, and he talked of a rigging scheme, he and the Wiper Party. Yeah. Uh, Prof, what do you think of that? And we'll get to IBC's response in just a moment. Uh, some Kenyans were saying, well, if this is happening with Kalonzo Musyoka, he's a bit more known. What about, you know, other lesser-known Kenyans? Mm. Yeah. Let me tell you... <clears throat> We've talked about the environment, and I think we will have to stay with that uh, concept of the environment uh, within which our election is, is taking place. Uh, elections are not about truth. Elections are not about reading verses in the Bible to convert people to some 
a century uh, beliefs or something. Uh, elections are about strategies of how to win. Elections have, in modern times, are the equivalent of war. And therefore, people use all manner of strategies to position themselves. I see in this election as rigging as a strategy. And the, you, the, the moment you claim that there's rigging, you claim again and again, it becomes the truth. The role of cleaning all these registers, including if you go to the US, UK, and everywhere, cleaning the register is a continuous process. Even during the, the day of voting, God forbid certain Kenyans in the register will lose their lives. Therefore, the, the day, even in the hour of voting, mm -hmm. somebody will be passing on, mm -hmm. passing on to his creator. And now, so the register cannot be 100% pure. Of course, when there are egregious issues, it's the role of IABC the, and the commission generally to ensure that we have a clean role. And that register should be available <coughs> to Kenyans. And I think this is what we demand. But it will demand. be available, it should you know, be available at the to end Kenyans. of the exercise for one so month. So the problem yeah. we are having uh -huh. is when the politicians turn themselves into candidates and also uh, they, they turn themselves into the commission because you are the one who is screaming about this, screaming about this, when we have a neutral arbiter. So you think the, the claims of rigging is it, a strategy they are sensed, they are to sensation, win? No, they are, they are not okay. their strategies to win. <laughs> they are strategies to ensure that there is paralysis at the end. This election is supposed to be very closely contested. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, the government has maintained the numbers it had. Now, let's very quickly take the arithmetic. The numbers from uh, the Jubilee strongholds alone, if mm -hmm. you look at them, and I'm not talking about the tyranny of numbers, the, mm -hmm. the Jubilee stronghold, not talking about the depredation they have made in the opposition stronghold, are enough to push them to power without a runoff, without a runoff. But the problem is, <coughs> if they go to power without a runoff, they are in, in 2017 and 2022. And that is not very good for po opposition politicians, some of whom are in their 70s and who not be eligible in 2022. Okay. All right. Therefore, you have to stop the jubilee in its tracks. And how do you do it? Rigging strategy. OK, let's hear from uh, Dr. Uh, I think uh, I couldn't disagree, especially when somebody with the title of professor doesn't yes. tackle the issue with facts. When you find Kalonzo Msioka saying that he has sent his request for verification to an IEBC SMS number, and he finds that somebody else with a name who is alive with an ID is also registered with the same ID, then for sure, alarm bells must come up. Let me give you an example. Let me but just is give it, you an is example. Is it a rigging scheme? In fact, let me or just tell you. Could it be an isolated incident? No, let me just tell you. Uh -huh. I'm sure you have an email address, either in Gmail or Yahoo. And when you go to register your email address, let's say, for example, Yvonneokwara at gmail.com, and somebody else has used that name, Yvonneokwara at gmail.com, mm -hmm. what will it do? It will reject, isn't it, that this name is already in use. So for the purposes of registration, the ID is the identification, first identification tool, not the name, because there can be so many Peter Kagwanjas. Mm -hmm. The only thing which will separate Peter Kagwanja A and Peter Kagwanja B registering is the ID number. And therefore, the moment a person sharing the same ID tries to register, and one had already registered, automatically the default system should reject. Why is it that this registration process of IEBC doesn't have a default system? It could only have been set up not to have it. Otherwise, it would have been rejecting. If that is not rigging, Professor, tell us what it is. Yeah, but that's what And if say. IEBC cannot come and explain to us why is it that their system doesn't have a default system? 
then IEBC but why should has I, a problem. Why should IEBC be reading at this early hour? And for who? Oh, no, no, no. I, I think please, it goes to... Please, please, for please. You know, Rigging doesn't start on the day of the sure, election. But why should it be for anybody? is a process. And let me tell you again, Yvonne. The reason why Kagwanja's part, he said oh. that they are planning for 2022. The reason why they would want to rig in advance is the same psychological warfare they used in 2013 that we have the tyranny of numbers. We are preparing. They want a okay. predetermined right. election. Uh, and therefore Dr. what we are saying, uh, a, a quick, what quick, we are quick, saying yeah. 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 is that the IBC, rather than waiting for people to come out and say that there are double registration, they should in advance tell us that this is the problem. If it is them coming okay. to tell us, right. rather than waiting for other people to mention it, okay. then we are going to have um, a problem. We'd like to interrogate that no, rigging scheme, but uh, Professor, you want to weigh in. Point. Yes. Uh, Professor, I am not a member up to this point of Jubilee Party. So when you, you say don't have Kagwanja, to be a member. Kagwanja's party, but yeah. ideologically, <laughs> yes. I'm aligned to them. So that's a, that's what I meant. Party, but let's make that point very clear yeah. because it is, you know, it's one thing to say so, so and so's party and another one to, for one to say... Okay, I'm where sorry, you are aligned to, if yeah. that will no, Not ideologically, <laughs> yes. kind of. Okay. Ideologically, right. if you agree. Fair enough. But, but then yeah. the other point is, I, I mean, the, uh, Professor has not invalidated my point mm -hmm. that all these claims are there. In fact, let's admit, the voters' role might be dirty, right? Mm -hmm. But why should a politician go out in public and sensationally make these claims? I am saying... This is part of a political strategy to use rigging claims in order to create paralysis at a certain stage and question the validity of a winner. That's it. So that you Look can here. have power sharing arrangement. Uh, right. Yvonne, okay, let, 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 let me weigh in. Let me weigh in on this because yes. I think that uh, Professor Kagwanja is among those that are throwing out those very dangerous statements and perceptions, including some of our, our uh, politicians. IBC have a responsibility to the citizens of Kenya, not to any particular political party or political affiliation or any politician. They have a responsibility to safeguard the voice of Kenyans and the decision that Kenyans make. And the starting point is a register that is clean and a process that has integrity. Now, already the exercise is showing that there are some serious problems, okay? And there are genuine fears that it may be a rigging scheme. And right. those are fears that are not unfounded because the IEBC, not as presently constituted, uh -huh. but as an electoral body, mm -hmm. has been used to rig elections and produce results for certain right. individuals I'd, I'd like and political to, parties. No, I'd so, like us to talk about the specific uh, allegation that Dr. Olo is also uh, bringing up, uh, saying that you know it should be geared towards the ID number, and should? if it doesn't, you know there's a problem in the system. Fair enough. But to go a step further and to say that this could only have been made to happen in this way and that it's been made to sort of reject this and allow for uh, double registration using the same ID number, that's a bit of a stretch beyond giving some serious uh, uh, proof. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's it's not a what stretch. I, I don't think it's a stretch. stretch. I don't think it's Let a stretch. Let me explain. Okay. Because All right. systems let's, let's hear are from programmed. We'll come to you. Systems are programmed. Yes. You program a system to respond in a certain manner so that... And there might not be a chink in the system? I mean, no. I'm not speaking the thing for ABC here, either but that the system going into is an allegation programmed. like that... No, it is either that the system uh -huh. is not programmed for that. Okay. And that is a question that we are asking because the thing that you use to identify, to register, is identification documents. And there are only two identification documents that IBC agree to, or, or rather, you can legally register the with. ID Either a national ID or, or a, a passport. passport. Now, you cannot have two numbers, two identical uh, ID numbers or passport numbers for different persons, right. okay? Now, that's what is coming out. There are 
and it's not so just this, this it is not just it is it is not just Kalonzo Musyoka there are other Kenyans yeah. who exactly. have actually suffered the same okay. okay and and these are things that are coming up because we are also carrying out yeah. civic right. education and people are asking yes. people say i went to register and i found my name my ID card registered as a under voter somebody else's under name. somebody else's right. name. Let's hear from Adam Zolo before we come to you. In fact, in Mbakasi, one of the Mbakasi constituencies, there are gentlemen who were in the NYS program. And you remember IEBC had loaned its biometrics to NYS, and they said that they wouldn't use it in this exercise, that those biometrics that they used to register people in the NYS that they loaned to the devolution ministry would it be used. These five gentlemen, when they went to register this week, they found that their IDs had already been used to register other people. And they, as we talk now, they can't be able to register. That is how serious it is, yeah. Yvonne. It's not about Kalozom Siaka or Ray okay. Lodinga. Right. It is about the people You're raising of Kenya. some serious allegations. Yes. No, I have no, I have no problem with those allegations, to mm. be honest with you. Even me, if I went today and found my number is not there, mm -hmm. I would be very concerned. But it is how the concerns are raised. Because politics is about how you articulate issues. It is not about and what you articulate. articulate let, me, let, me, let me put it this way. The moment you decide to sensationalize something, because after February, when the registration is over, what is the next exercise? The next exercise is to clean the, the register. And we have the principles of all political parties who can even call a conference or even themselves take their team to IBC to see whether the register is called. Why are we sensationalizing it when the registration process twice is going beaten, on? The, twice the, whole, the whole issue is, and why one party? Why is it the because opposition the other one and not the government? Now, the, 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 we have two Pharisees here. One, that the entire registr re register is compromised. Mm -hmm. Then building on that Pharisee, you say that the government or the, the ruling party is a compromise in that. And therefore, okay. we have the third Pharisee, uh -huh. which is that this is a scheme for 2013. This is, these are explications upon right. explications upon... I'd like Can to I respond to that? Uh, yes, and I'd like to, very quickly, because we're running out of time, you I'd see, like to introduce another... Peter Kagwanja is not in government. He yeah. might be by another design, I don't know. Yes. But we have a situation <laughs> in which the president, who is the head of state, as head of government, we allow him to politic because his party formed the government. But he's the head of state. And he came out very clearly, for example, and said that uh, IDs should be processed faster mm -hmm. and that uh, the provincial administration should come in and help. Then the Minister for Interior comes in mm -hmm. and says that any chief in opposition stronghold found helping in listing voters shall be fired or even transferred. What do you say to that, Peter Kagwanja? Well, uh, um, you're asking me, like, I, this because is you are defending the them, the but he's defending them. <laughs> no, no, so I'm the not one who can the well, You're also, to I'm, be fair, defending uh, the other side. So. Yeah. I'm calling for logic here. Yeah. Yeah. That one. We differentiate technical processes that are, by law, entrusted among I, within, um, IABC. These okay. are questions we should be asking. And political processes, which is about winning the hearts and minds of Kenyans All in right. whatever way I'd, I'd like for 2017. We, we must throw uh, this uh, Prof, allow me to interject, because the process of you know, auditing the voter register is, is something that was uh, uh, you know, agreed upon. Mm -hmm. yes. And in fact, KPMG, and it's uh, in the, law. the audit firm, yeah, it's in the law and, and, and was um, contracted to do this process. And then this process goes to court, and that has now been stopped. And many say, well, ODM is shooting itself in the foot, no. going to court with that process, no. asking for an international firm. What is the specific problem that ODM has uh, with KPMG auditing this voter register? Look, even when they debated, and you can bring members of the panel who are there from both sides, they agreed that the firm to do this audit must be one that not only has capacity 
and that has done it elsewhere. You can't just go and pick any audit firm that is used in financial audit and bring to audit the voter register. That's number one. Number two, at the time that court went to court and when it was just one day to KPMG starting the audit, the stakeholders that you keep on talking about, and court is a stakeholder, had not discussed the methodology, had not been brought into the table to agree on the methodology of auditing this register. For example, did this audit of the register, was it going to involve a sample? Was it going to involve everybody going to confirm their biometrics because that's the way we were registered? Was it going to involve even those who would have been registering right now because there'll be fresh registration. Those issues needed to have been addressed. None of them was addressed. And here you are telling KPMG to go ahead without any capacity, without any methodology, without any experience. Come on, please. The one that was done in Nigeria removed 7.5 million voters from the register. That's how serious that, that an audit usually is. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, right. and uh, I, I, I do want to agree. Yeah. <clears throat> because I think that, um, first of all, given the fact that the political pillar is a very critical pillar to the stability of the social and economic pillar, mm -hmm. you cannot just gloss over issues. And having that it was agreed that the voter register should have been audited, is to be audited, I think that in good faith, good faith demands that the process should have been done by an audit firm that has the expertise in auditing voter registers because it's not just about auditing you know and and so you know when th th these are the kind of things that uh, the, the kind of actions that make people read ill intent in some of these things because if you are committed to ensuring that you have a free fair and transparent process it begins by ensuring that every player is comfortable. And it would have costed them absolutely nothing to involve all stakeholders. And it's not just about Jubilee or Cord, because remember that you have the PPLC, the Political Parties Liaison Committees, yeah. where you have political parliamentary political parties and non-parliamentary mm -hmm. political parties. Mm -hmm. At the very least, because these are the parties that are usually involved in ensuring you know, the electoral regulatory framework and all that, these parties should have all been brought on board as equal players you know, in the forthcoming general election. But when you have one side that apparently seems to have advantage over another, and IBC being careless enough not to involve all stakeholders, people automatically read malice. And okay. without, not without cause, not without cause. All right, so we're in this environment. Um, this seems to be mistrust on both sides with this process. There's a lot of deadlines that have not been met mm -hmm. uh, considering procurement, you know, the ballot printing process uh, and, uh, you know, the procurement of the integrated electoral system. And yet there is talk, you know, in certain circles about making voting mandatory. Uh, you'd alluded to this in the beginning. Some countries are like, I believe Australia uh, does it. But is this where we want to go now? Should we start to make it mandatory uh, for people to register and to vote? And, you know, that whole saying of bad leaders are elected by good people that do not vote. It's becoming a bit of a cliche that's thrown around. But uh, some people are also reading malice into mandatory voting. Others are saying it should be the way to go. What do you think, Paul? Uh, I, I think it's, it's, in Kenya it's not necessary to make it mandatory at mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. because I think the population in Kenya from a long time ago, I think we are committed to the democratic process. Kenyans believe that through the democratic process you can build your society and therefore they come out to vote. Uh, some, I'm told, come, you know, when they are sick, they get from the hospital, come vote and go back. Uh, you know, so it's not necessary to make it uh, law at this juncture. Would it ever at be this necessary? Ju it may be in the future, but I don't think we will reach that apathy. If you look at the voting in Nyanza uh, in 2013, for example, uh, a bit of a, an average of 91% voter turnout around that time. If you look at other areas, in the Central and the Rift Valley, in the 90s, uh, that is the highest ever registered in the world. 
uh, it, and it was ba balanced. In Ukambani, it was uh, the, the high 80s. Yeah. Uh, the coast, it was high 60s to the 70s. Uh, I mean, no, very few countries, even in the US, in the contestation mm -hmm. that we have, they, they never really go beyond 60. Mm -hmm. So Kenyans, we don't need mandatory voting. Okay. What we need is to de uh, de ethnicize our voting patterns. What we have in this country now are what you can call, in Jamaica, they call it garrisoned communities. Mm -hmm. Garrisoned community because if you are, for example, within a certain region, you are under pressure to vote for certain people. And whether those people are forcing you or not, the community around you yeah. will either isolate you or feel like you are a traitor if you don't vote a certain way. I hope my daughters, I hope my sons, I hope my grandsons will be able to vote whoever they want to vote without feeling the pressure that they have to vote because they carry a certain name. Okay. And I think that's a burden that Kenya has to get off its back. Now, politicians are exploiting that. So when people start talking about my strongholds, my strongholds, stronghold is a synonym for ethnic groups, which is a pity uh, in the 21st century that a country claiming democratic credentials like Kenya will still hedge its democratic future on ethnic balkanization when most of us don't even know their tribes. Okay. Where would we get to uh, in your closing comments? Uh, Prof. is talking about, you know, where he hopes to see the country. Uh, there's a bit of voter apathy, perhaps, which is why we're talking about mandatory voter registration and mandatory voting. Uh, but where do, we, where do you see us heading uh, in this process? Well, you know, for as long as we continue with um, the ethnic um, uh, mobilization, of course, it's not a sustainable approach to anything because one of the things that ethnic uh, mobilization does, it takes away the need for people to interrogate the leadership because the only thing that I need to be is your tribes person for me to qualify for leadership. I don't have to be a good leader. I don't have to deliver on my promises. The other thing is, while we have a blueprint in the Constitution of Kenya 2010 to actually take us to those new lands, the current crop of leadership, seeing as they continue with the ethnic mobilization, are not the right leadership to get us to where we need to go. Either that, or they have not internalized the the the. the so the, the these principles, some of the issues that would the lead principles. to voter apathy? Because well, Kenyans aren't... you know, Kenyans, uh, as, you know, as Professor see, Kagonja yeah. said, Kenyans really do. I mean, they get excited yeah. about the, 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 the electoral process. Uh -huh. And so, so far, we've not really seen voter apathy. You know, when you look at turnouts, uh -huh. whether it was the referendum, mm -hmm. whether it's elections, we still have high voter turnout levels. What it is, is I think that issues, because uh, uh, Kenyans are now beginning to make the connection between the kind of lives that they have and the kind of... of of, of leaders that uh -huh. they choose. And, the policy and I think results. that for us now, you know, for me, as long as we have uh, leaders who continue to mobilize ethnically, they begin to lose the plot because Kenyans can transform this country by demanding issues of their leaders. But the media also needs to help Kenyans make that connection by framing the issues, mm -hmm. not uh, framing the, the election around the ethnic mobilization or the zoning or the tyranny of numbers. Make it about issues so people begin to demand answers from their leaders. We have been given promises. We were given promises in 2013. Have you delivered? If you haven't, why should we believe anything that you're saying now? Okay. So I think that for me, as long as these guys, if we, we cannot compete with the current political class on ethnicity because they are good at it. That's what they know how to do. What they don't know how to do uh -huh. is address issues. Is address and issues. if we change our politics to issues-based politics, we will automatically sweep away the old crop of leaders and, and begin get to get ones. the new crop of All leaders right. that will take us to the new land as envisioned in the Constitution 2010. Okay. Dr. Olo, your final comments, because I know you've talked about this. I read a paper uh, that you had in the Toweza publication, which you know has all of these papers regarding the 2013 elections, and you said uh, basically the same thing about ethnicization of uh, political parties, as it were, basically because there's no party in the country that has ideologies that are different from each other, mm -hmm. that all of them are based on social democracy. So where does that leave us then? Well, you see, what I was saying in that paper was that when you are doing political mobilization, you can either do it based on identity or ideas. When you are doing it on identity, the identity can either be tribe it can be race, religion. it can be religion, mm -hmm. it can be region, and so on. 
In Kenya, it has been tried. When you are basing it on ideas, then you go to ideology. So you are either a social democrat, you are a liberal democrat, if you are a bad person, you are a fascist. Yes, but, but, but you say, you know, but it was interesting in that paper that you said that no political party, and I think I many said, Kenyans would what say I that they're said, not different what I in, what I in basically essence from each said, other. What I basically said is that uh -huh. if you look at most political parties in Kenya, at least the manifesto, that's what yeah. you can judge them yeah. from, then they'll be forming, they'll be following either one strand of social democracy or another, that the difference yeah. is in the detail. Yeah. And once the difference is in the detail, then it places you in a straight jacket in which you can only isolate certain issues which you fight the fight on and then placate on identity. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality in Kenyan politics. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you want yeah, to just yeah. wait one mm -hmm. minute? Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think the, the identities that uh, Professor is mentioning are critical, but uh, I think the, the, he's ignoring the most critical one for 2017, uh -huh. which I think is the age, the generational. Why do I say so? The number that we are scrambling for now to register are our sons and daughters born between 1989 and 1999, who constitute in total about 60.8% of our population. So we are not talking about the old generation. The old generation registered. A few of them might have passed away or missed the registration. But this is the number. And this is a group that does not believe in e this ethnic mongering or ethnic mobilization. This Yet you still find they mobilize sure. sure. around no, I mean, the I mean, tribe and, and they, they, they the still do. That is okay, but we can teach them. You, I, you talked optimistically about the future. I talk yeah. about the future this, optimistically because yes. for us, particularly as women, tribe does not favor 20, women. 20, tribe is patriarchal. It doesn't favor women, so we okay. must move away from it. 2017 is must, about generational crash. Well, and for those me, who are in the, the right, grandfathers, okay. uh -huh. the fathers, and the sons, and the grandfathers. That one needs, That's a, it. That uh, needs okay. a rebuttal. You know uh, who they are. Uh, that needs a rebuttal. We're, we're that finished. generational okay. change right. is a myth. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's a myth. It's it a is. myth because no, no, a those who came the on digital the, uh -huh. platform, you can see they are forcing us back to analog. So <laughs> that's it. you can exactly see <laughs> that. I think generational in terms of age. That's yeah. Well, we but generational in terms with, of no? age, but look at the people who voted for them, if it is about generational right. change. Okay, okay clearly. Yeah. The old generation lady? is voluntarily getting out to leave the younger generation. So in other countries like right. Nigeria and Kenya, and we, in are Ghana, we are going back. That's what Ghana, I'm saying. In Ghana, going back. In Ghana so a 72 friends. year old has been overwhelmingly voted as it's a about president. It's about issues. Gentlemen, ladies, so it's it's issues. ideally it should about be about issues. issues. Yes. Yes. But we definitely yes. need, what, two, three hours to yeah, discuss yeah, this issue. So. Um, so. But I thank you for your time and in, in hoping to see uh, where we want to go. Thank you very much, yeah, Professor sure. Peter Kagwanja, Daisy Amdani, and Dr. Adam Zolo. Thank you. Uh, what do you think? Weigh in. Uh, quite a number of issues have come up in this one. Is it a generational issue? Will we be voting based on issues manifestos do you see any differences there even as you go towards uh, registering to be a voter if uh, you had not done so previously please weigh in on this discussion the hashtag is checkpoint we'd love to hear from you we're taking a quick break we'll be right back thank you